Okay. Right. Well, uh, uh, welcome to the first event in the C20 Cymru Autumn Programme. Uh, a talk tonight by Josh Jones on the Lidos of Wales. Uh, just a little bit first for those of perhaps you haven't joined us before. Uh, C20 Cymru is the representation in Wales of the 20th Century Society, uh, a society which works to increase the understanding, appreciation and protection of the built and design heritage of the 20th century across the UK. We in Wales are, are quite a small group of volunteers who are always happy to welcome new people to our monthly online meetings. So if there's anybody here today which, who is already a, a member of the 20th Century Society and we would like to get involved with our work here in Wales, uh, please do get in touch with us. And uh, I'm sure we've got quite a few people who aren't already members of the Society, um, in which case please take a look at the 20th Century Society website and our sort of Twitter and Instagram pages and have a look at what we do and perhaps consider uh, lending us your support as well. Uh, we do have two further events which are currently open for booking on Eventbrite as well. Firstly, on Saturday the 1st of October, we've got a guided walk of Harlech, led by Andrew Davidson of the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust. A uh, tour which will include the opportunity to actually get inside the wonderful Theatre Ardudwy and Colleg Harlech complex. And then on Tuesday, the 22nd of November, we've got another online evening talk on Carnegie Libraries in Wales by Professor Oriel Prizman of the Welsh School of Architecture. Um, booking for both of those is available on Eventbrite uh, with direct links from our Twitter and Instagram pages. So now into tonight's talk. So I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, Josh Jones, a part two architectural assistant at Western Williamson and Partners. Josh completed his Master of Architecture at the Welsh School of Architecture in Cardiff, where his master's thesis was on the Lidos and open air swimming pools of Wales, with a particular focus on Brynam and Lido, where there's currently a huge community undertaking to get the site repaired and reopened for the public. Josh is happy to answer questions after the talk, so please post any questions you have in the question and answer, question and answer box rather than the chat, just so we make sure we don't um, sort of um, miss any. And with that, I'll hand you over to Josh for his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's, um, it's a pleasure to present the project to, to everyone and hopefully um, the presentation will um, give you all a little insight into, into Lido's of Wales, where they've come from, um, and a bit of context on the global scale of, of, of the kind of principles and, and, and driving forces behind outdoor swimming pools. So uh, the agenda for this talk is going to give a little bit, bit of historical context, looking at kind of um, ideas of race, segregation, the physical culture um, in Australia, America, um, Europe, and a bit closer to home um, in the UK before we explore, explore the Lidos um, in a Welsh context, um, and then zooming in to focus on Brynam and, um, and the history of that swimming pool and um, how the research I, I, I kind of produced um, in partnership with um, people from Brunam and, and, and local residents to um, recover and reconstruct the, the narratives of, of the lost buildings so we could justify to um, uh, grant funds and lotteries why this heritage building um, needed saving. So I'll, I'll start with a chapter on uh, historical context um, and few typologies ask us to become vulnerable and remove ourselves from our previous selves as those related to water, um, whether to survive for sport or recreation, humans have always found um, a reason to bathe. And we entered the public swimming pools, the saunas or um, the beach, really with a, with a heightened sense of awareness of our bodies and the bodies of others. And similar public bathing typologies, such as the banners of Northern Europe, ask users to remove everything um, simultaneously stripping their users of social distinctions, wealth and identity. In these spaces we see the formation of collective synergies where all spaces um, try to form a communal feel within them, um, even if they're only temporary. But there are traditions of, of firm of, of swimming pools, banyas, saunas and hammams which uh, point to the ongoing cross-cultural influence and capacity for reinvention 
where bathing cultures are inherently social and rich bathing architectures are inherently public. But although open air swimming pools and most bathing typologies don't require total nudity and exposure, typologies of bathing commonly ask us to shed our exoskeletal skeletons in transitioning between um, public spaces, the private spaces with something a little communal in between. But the history of uh, public artificial pools is largely a product of European um, enlightenment and modernism. And the benefits of bathing in seawater was discovered as early as 1750 by the French army. And bathing for health and cleanliness was, um, was soon promoted. From the 18th century, water had become increasingly important in domestic life, particularly through the integration of plumbing into homes and the widespread use of water in picturesque gardens. But Palladio um, conjectured reconstruction of the baths of Caracalla had formal, had formal bathing cultures in classical antiquity through its origins, um, but its origins go back further. But equipped with hot and cold and tepid baths, together with um, gymnasiums and libraries, Caracalla was a kind of hedonistic temple which um, calculated to cultivate body and, and minds. But it was the floating pools um, of Europe in the late 18th century that saw the first real interest in swimming as an instructive act. Um, and as was the case with the evolution of many modern practices and spaces, military organizations also played a large role in popularizing swimming. Um, more widespread interest in physical health, athleticism and education coincided with military swimming as a way to keep armies maneuverable and fit. Roman baths provided the model for the bathhouse that emerged in Britain from the 17th century. Um, and they have evolved into modern swimming pools and lidos that we see today in the 20th century. But modern swimming pools might also be seen as a process of creativity and domestic domestication. Pools transform natural bodies of water into highly artificial, contained, controlled and specialized environments. Um, and the modernization processes emerged properly in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, and by 1920, a swimming costume shred, shed their Victorian layers and became lighter. Um, pools became even more transparent um, as large spans of glazing became, became kind of more achievable in its architecture. But new types of urban swimming facilities appeared during the latter 19th century when bathing became more strictly codified by taking on the functions of public facilities for hygiene and for sport. But although pools are symbolic sites of freedom where we can drop social constraints um, along with our trousers, uh, they have a darker side. Um, bathing spaces are to be at the center of tensions between public and private, race and class, gender and sexuality, um, sacred and profane, ritual and habitual, pure and impure, uh, nature and culture and to contextualize um, the lives of Wales and, and, and Brahman a little bit I'm going to briefly touch on similar um, outdoor pools in a global context um, which will explore themes of, of racism which polluted American waters, body image and segregation which contaminated Australian waters and then we will look closer to home touching briefly on public open air pools within the British context before um, arriving back in Wales. So this slide um, talks about US pools and um, US municipal pools boomed between kind of 1920 and 1940. And as a nation, national swimming fad inspired millions to take to the water for recreation um, swims and, and to the pool decks for tanning and socialization. Um, and in the 1930s, the New York D Department of Parks came under the control of um, one of the famous urban planners of all time in Robert Moses. Um, and he was a public official who worked in the New York metropolitan area. And these pools are kind of open to swimmers of all classes, which flocked to their decks and diving boards. And these pools essentially became community centers. Um, but these pools were designed for kind of competitive and leisure swimming, but they were largely the realm of the white elite at the time, not only restricting African Americans from these pools, but Latinos and Asian Americans who were kind of forced elsewhere. 
Um, and in cases where there was an official segregation, white swimmers imposed and enforced racial segregation through, through violence, um, harassing people of colour until they left the pools. And there's kind of poster which I came across, which is um, from the Learn to Swim campaign, which invited children from all ages into these pools. Um, it, was a, it was a WPA arts project, uh, a poster from the New York Department of Parks, which tried to attract uh, the youth of the city to the pools, but its posters also highlighted the racial segregation which became present in these, wa in these waters with African-American, as you can see in the poster, there's African-Americans on one side of the pool and white children on the other. But the deeper you dive into the history of American municipal pools, the more you begin to uncover the, the aspects of racial segregation, particularly in public uh, swimming pools that, that were privatised. Um, and in some instances, in, in this example, where the boys tried to enter and attendants refused to let them in because of their skin colour, they were told to go to the city's much smaller second uh, public pools, um, one of unofficially designated for black swimmers instead. But in response to this, swimmobiles were introduced during the um, Heckscher administration and literally took pools to the streets to the underserved areas. Um, and the city owned five uh, mobile pools, which were towed around the city to different parts, um, different neighbourhoods. But ironically, it was these groups of whom public swimming pools were initially created for the working class and the impoverished families of densely populated urban areas um, were then and are still today the groups with the most limited access to, to swimming facilities. So we move across the, the, the Pacific and look at um, Australian waters and um, pools in Australia didn't really start um, in earnest until the mid 1950s where the personal and social benefits of recreational time with families and friends became well established. Um, in Queensland and elsewhere in the country, the, the, the government encouraged the construction of swimming pools and many became memorial pools dedicated to those who had fought to defend the Australian way of life in World War I. But World War I destroyed um, human bodies on an unprecedented scale. 10 million people dead, 20 million had severe casualties in, and 8 million were permanently disabled. But Many believe that the reconstruction of the body through thought of in the kind of classical ideal of mind-body harmony, harmony um, attributed social values to, to bodily facts. The Australian pool as a kind of place for serious swimmers, which most Australians do, exemplifies the balance and act between architecture, between body, space and program. And the swimming pools in Australia were kind of very public and they're sort of seen as the Australian kind of public space. It's their version of the piazza or the square, um, a key site of social interaction. But it was Max Dunplain's 1937 um, photograph called Sunbakers, and this, this was an iconic photograph which dissipated the head and shoulders of a healthy young man lying on the beach, and he frequently had been uh, called an Australi Australian icon. Um, and the image was a symbol of the Australian way of life. Um, and through the early 20th century, the artistic focus on the body was strongly um, tied to the country's sunbathing culture. And it was about glorifying health, um, capable bodies under the sun, um, and it became a way of commemorating the wounded and deceased bodies of, of war. But I see in the US and Australia as well, these pools were had a, you know, a few stories of embedded racism and, and within the, their pools where indigenous children were not allowed to swim in some public pools. Um, this enforced segregation was the catalyst for demonstration at pools um, such as the Freedom Rides, where, which were regarded as a turning point in Australian indigenous civil rights movements. And as recently as the 1960s, it was, it was routine for Aboriginal people to be banned from public swimming pools. But the pool was the site of one of the key kind of events in Australian racial politics and history of the Aboriginal civic rights movement and freedom rights was a time when students and activists went out to rural New South Wales and protested against the exclusion and segregation of Aboriginal people from these pools. 
Yet, whilst these pools had a history of segregation and racism, some were also commended for their architectural contribution to modernism. Um, where the Canberra Olympic Pool won the Sullivan Award of the Royal Australian Institute of Architects for its outstanding architectural merit, um, with its long horizontal elevations, flat roofs, um, curved projecting skylights, balustrades, and flagpoles. Um, but its architecture was characteristic of the kind of post war international style. Moving closer to home now, looking at at the UK, we begin to understand the typology as a space for performance and athleticism informed by this kind of physical culture movement. Um, this saw militaristic attitudes developed towards the act of swimming during um, across Western Europe, particularly in Germany, who was estimated to have built uh, 1,360 pools by 1922. Um, and as was the case with the evolution of many modern practices, um, and spaces, military organisations also played a large role in popularising swimming um, in the UK. But more widespread, the interest in physical health, athleticism and education, again, coincided with um, military swimming um, training as a way to keep armies manoeuvrable and fit. And similar to the Australians, the reappraisal of the human body and the need to improve people's health following war coincided with the introduction of new legislation such as the Physical Training and Recreational Act of 1937. Um, but when the Australians wanted to remember the lost, um, in Europe my kind of observation was that swimming was arguably about strengthening the human physique in, antici in anticipation of another war given the militaristic attitudes towards these spaces. But these are principles reflected in its architecture, if like and in these springboards and diving boards, where modern architecture was not just about the expression of movement in structure, but also about capturing the possibilities of the human body. And the Training and Recreation Act of 1937 also saw an increase in the construction of pools and new ideas of outdoor physical fitness was created from foreign influence and movements such as the Sunlight League saw exposure to the sun deemed a medical treatment and slowly the pools became culturally repositioned from spaces of militaristic attitudes to spaces of pleasure and leisure. Um, known as prevent preventative heliotherapy, um, sunbathing was one of those practices and literature speaks of the clear connection between sunlight and sociology, uh, which arguably coincided with a new aesthetic consideration of the human body, where the bronze skin sporty appearance became the desirable body image of choice, similarly to that in Australian waters. The Lidos were open air pools that enabled individuals to participate in the healthy exercise and of swimming, whilst exposing the body to as much sunlight as possible. Um, and the image of the socially desirable body began to alter. The white skin, which had until now been the mark by which nobility and others had distinguished themselves from weather-beaten farm laborers and workers, lost its value as the dominant social norm. Now it was about the bronze skin, sporty appearance, which um, exuded social prestige. Um, but developments in architecture and engineering coincided with a reduced level of investment in public recreation during the final quarter of the 20th century and saw many open air pools return indoors. Um, mass leisure met the welfare stake and spawned a huge variety of buildings inspired by the modernist movement. Um, the Edinburgh 1970 Commonwealth Pool was a symbol of the welfare state ethos, which was uh, strongly informed by utopian ideas of community. Um, and the Commonwealth Pool um, subtly implanted at the interface of Victorian Edinburgh and was the chief standard bearer of Edinburgh's uh, post-war strategy um, of modern conservative surgery. Sorry, wrong page. Although the moving site was somewhat permanent in most cases, um, just across uh, the English Channel in France, it was a kind of hybridised um, solution where mass-produced pristine, I think they're called tornadoes, were built by um, an engineer whose name was Bernard Scholler in the 1970s, who aimed to build a thousand pools in France 
um, with the objective to strengthen the practice of swimming amongst its youth um, and shaped in the form of sunflowers. Development in industrial manufacturing processes allowed the prototype to be developed for 183 pools, um, which were exactly the same, I think, to be built nationwide. But such developments led to us or kind of leisure seeking swimmers wanting more and more and more. Um, and this came in the form of aquatic escapism in the form of um, leisure pools, where machine waves, lazy rivers and spaghetti like flumes swallowed up those seeking alternative fluid experiences. But we have seen across the early and mid 20th century that outdoor swimming pools negotiated the turbulence of cultural repositioning from being spaces of militaristic attitudes in the early 20th century to becoming places of leisure and pleasure following the conclusion of war and the reappraisal, reappraisal of the human body. Um, arguably, my observation was that the pressure of modernism made people see um, these buildings and others alike as symbols of past civic times. And yet today, along with the many um, challenges we all face, we, we have found ourselves kind of craving environments which bring people together in places where the urban or rural need these types of spaces where people can meet, mingle, socialize and survive and swim through the modern challenges that life may present. And open air swimming pools, they're kind of a typology which has been known to assist with, um, with such challenges. So now for the part that we've all come for, um, I think and that's the Leiders of Wales on, in the Welsh context. And in Wales, there were 57 open air pools built during the 20th century. And what's interesting is that 36 of them were found um, in the South Wales coalfield. Um, and the economic depression of the 1930s saw the coalfield workforce half by 1932. Yet, open air pools continued to be built in part by a workforce comprised of unemployed miners, um, thanks to the available, availability of labour caused by the temporary collapse of the mining industry. But additionally, uh, statutory bodies such as the Miners' Welfare Fund and the Special Areas Commission also provided uh, some financial support for poor construction, but it wasn't in all cases. Many open air swimming pools in Wales were in highly industrialised areas. Um, of the South Wales coal, coal fields, but it's kind of suggested that pools here were not built to accommodate the competitive human seal, if you like, um, rather for the purpose of recreation, leisure and pleasure. And where pools in Australia, for example, had a strong relationship between landscape, people and geology, the people of Wales or the pools of Wales did not. And in Wales, there was a kind of a disharmony between building and landscape. And the open air swimming pools served to show a contrast to its natural setting where many of the pools kind of, of, the, of the mountainside and rural pools away from our cent, uh, town centres were an architectural contrast to the landscape. That distinction can be drawn between pools built by urban district councils and those by the manual labour of um, an implied, unemployed an force of the coalfield. And some of the mountainside pools, such as this one built in 19, 1900 in Abertilla area, was one of the first such um, open air swimming baths provided by a local authority, I believe. Um, but this was superseded by a leisure centre built in town in 1970 and it survived up until the 1980s. But it's evident in its outbuildings that a cohesive and simplistic approach was taken to the construction with a kind of simple colour scheme, often limited to basic industrial colours like white, grey and beige. But they often try to incorporate the fewest different materials as possible. Um, but all of the materials can be con considered somewhat industrial um, with concrete structures and um, some steel elements. But it's, in terms of this design language, earlier 20th century pools reflected a period of transition in which the kind of predominantly classical styling was employed, employed to clothe um, a thoroughly modern type and function. Another one of the um, mountainside pools was at Treharis, and this was built in 1937 with the aid of Special Areas Commission grant. Um, and we again start to see similar principles with an overriding emphasis on functionality and efficiency where the unnecessary was stripped away. Um, 
And they again utilize low cost and readily available materials to make simplistic buildings, which with kind of reduced openings to ensure that those seeking shelter inside these small outbuildings um, would be securely sheltered from the elements. Um, and in the mountainside cause, there was no emergence of ornamentation with kind of um, architectural cascades and, and so on. It was just kind of clean lines and, and, and clean edges. Another example is at Troya Hill um, by Merthyr, Merthyr Tidville, and this was built on the hillside by unemployed mines again in 1937. But whilst the mountainside location was the perfect retreat away from polluted lowlands, um, the access provisions for maintenance along the route to the mountainside may have contributed to, to the pool's closure in, in, in the mid 1960s, but it's, it's, its remnants are still um, largely available to see today. Moving more down towards the lowlands and the lowlands pools, the lowland pools in Wales, their architecture, um, the architecture of the Sun Bazir had a kind of stronger connection to its context, I believe. And here the same materials used to build housing locally was used to construct the pools. Um, and this pool at Getley Gallet Park was the first public uh, swimming baths opened in the, the Ronda Valleys, but built by the Ronda Urban District Council, the bath remains in use until the construction of a modern indoor leisure centre um, at Getley Gallet Park in the early 1980s. Architecturally, what became interesting about this lowland pool was its position within the valley. Um, and exposed to the elements, it, it, was ex it was at the same time enclosed where tall boundary walls would shelter bathers from uh, the elements and strong winds and so on. Um, but it was again with the aim of creating a totally contrasting experience to what was present outside of these walls. Um, it was the architecture itself which served as the symbol of contrast. Um, at Treherbert, another one of the pools aided by urban district funding, um, you again begin to see the kind of increased degree of quality in, 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 in the building fabric. Um, slate, pitched roof and pitched roofs, um, covered brick and timber outbuildings where detailing is, is um, minimally kind of expressed um, throughout all of the, around all of the openings. Um, here are rectangular roof lights allowed light to enter the outbuildings and Security barriers provided a secure boundary to the pool area where onlookers could uh, watch the youth um, and sporting events that were present in these environments. But whilst at other pools, there was kind of terrace space in abundance, at this pool, the lack of terrace space for sunbathers is suggested that a more fitness orientated approach may have been taken to the, to the construction um, of this pool. But whilst this pool had more physical fitness apparatus than most of the regional pools. You can see that the pools were used for many more sporting activities such as uh, water polo um, and there's uh, images of diving and so on. Um, again, you, you kind of see where the perimeter fencing um, became the place where onlookers um, could observe really. And open air pools would form a part of a wider sporting complex in, in some cases where kind of bowling greens, tennis courts and playing fields formed a large recreational ground within, um, within coalfield towns. But whilst they are built with locally made and readily available materials, the way the architecture is composed is different to those of mountainside pools. Um, at Bryn Mawr, I apologise slightly for the quality of these photos, but again, it, um, they were taken quite a, um, a long time ago. But the Pool of Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr is kind of a, um, a unique situation. It was built on um, the site of a former coal slag heap. And at Bryn Mawr, the International Voluntary Service organised a camp at Bryn Mawr, and the members of which worked together with the unemployed um, and played a key part in, in the making of this pool. But these volunteers came from eight countries, um, including Belgium, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Switzerland, France, Germany, Norway, and the US. And they came to the UK with the aid of forming stronger continental ties following, um, following war, really. But here there was a, a kind of unique conversation. I wouldn't say unique in this asset, but in terms of um, this point, you may see at Brenham as well, where 
there was a conversation about transforming sites of waste into sites of utility, of ugliness into beauty, by means of voluntary labour of the of the unemployed, a common theme throughout pools of the South Wales coalfield, which had in this case changed an old rubbish tip into um, into a thing of beauty. But like many of the rural pools and mountainside pools of Wales, its architecture rejected the ornamentation of Victorian styles in favour of um, sleek minimalism and functionalism. Um, or the idea that a building should prioritise functionality above, above else, drawing on the modern, modernist principles of clean lines, flat roofs and modern materials in the form of concrete and steel. Um, architecturally, the use of traditional forms and the mishmash of readily available materials suggested that the origins of many pools in Wales lie um, with the voluntary labour of the unemployed and mining workforce. And some argue that they also took inspiration from the Art Echo movement, and, and which had kind of strong maritime themes. But as seen in Wales, I hope you may have seen over the past couple of, sli couple of slides that there was not a kind of coherent architectural style or identity for these pools. It was arguably a, um, a sort of bricolage assembly of what was readily available. And in some pools, style um, followed minimalist principles, um, clean, line, clean lines, readily available materials, efficiency and functionality, where aesthetic became secondary to function and an architectural contrast to the uh, immediate context. So now we'll move on to Bryn Ammon. I'll just pause for a glass of water. Um, and for my research, Bryn Ammon formed the primary case study um, of my research. It's, it's my home time, my home um, And it's previously been known as the Big Gutter um, in Welsh, Gutter Vaur. Um, and it's long been peppered with shifts in extractive industries from limestone in its northern moorlands to coal mining in its south. It's a village which um, sits within a geologically rich valley bottom marking the transition between uh, lime rich quarries of the Black Mountains and the rich coal fields to the south, both of which have historically sustained the region and its position um, at the transition threshold between kind of domestic, rural and the barren territories of uh, the Black Mountains. But what remains today is largely a superimposed, undulating and over-intensified landscape of vegetated and stabilised mounds of coal. Um, and it has formed a kind of intricate mesh of the remnants of buildings from different industrial periods, which um, once they're lost um, or their history forgotten, uh, they take their detect detectable recollections and memories of past lives with it. So the Pool at Bernaman, um was built um, and opened in 1934 by um, members of the Swansea Swimming Club who were invited to give an exhibition um, ceremony for local residents. And like many pools, it can be argued that Bernaman had reinvented and repurposed itself socially and culturally since its opening. Um, little is known about its history during uh, its initial years, yet kind of temporary structures speak of the cultural position of pools during this period, where swimming galas and diving exhibitions were commonly seen ac across open air um, pools and the kind of temporary grandstands can be seen as a spaces where cheering supporters would sit and, and kind of observe these galas and, and dive performances. But there's also images which um, suggested that local schools used the pool to teach young children how to swim. Um, which again can be connected to this cultural position of swimming pools um, as an instructed act at the time. Um, and here you can see the master uh, is instructing his students where each student, if you like, has no individual agenda. Exercise and learning were the sole focus and any other motives or passions had to be left in the classroom or in the changing rooms. But the focus on the healthy uh, reconstructed body and the rising popularity of swimming as a sport also affected the um, applied arts and the drive to reconstruct the body which was expressed through art in the indoor years now became a very applied tangible goal as citizenship was increasingly shaped in biological terms of health um, and reproductive competence and informed the development of new 
government funded welfare programs. But at Brunamen, it's possible to see how open air pools became the driving force for wider expansion of the site. Um, and as a place of recreation where the pool became an essential part of the sporting arena, if you like, and a, a great asset for the community. Um, and most of what you see in, in the photo of the right is actually what still remains, um, what still remains today. In relation to his architecture, trying to unearth blueprints failed given that the pool was built by the hands of many fathers and grandfathers of the village. Um, I had begun to explore its architecture by trying to break down the photographs which were put forward by villagers and participants and we kind of came, well I kind of came to the conclusion that outbuildings initially comprised of timber studwork and siding canopied by corrugated roofing sheets um, and these sheltered the users until the 1950s when new single skinned brick outbuildings were introduced. Um, within the 46 uh, changing rooms, a double hinged timber door allowed for privacy above ankle height, completed with a simple twin batten timber bench. And a raised terrace west of the water provided comfortable um, space for the leisure seeking swimmer and the kind of bronze skin pleasure seeking swimmers. But again, with this one, it was kind of perceived as a typology collaged rather than designed. And the lack of design expertise used to construct this pool, as many others, is emphasized in the detail. Yet explains the kind of use what we had approach um, in its construction through the use of local labor um, and local materials. But what's interesting about photographs is that they are really um, kind of interpretation of the real um, and a trace of something directly stenciled off the real, like a footprint. Um, and hence why sometimes you have to look further into them and try to situate yourself um, within the position and you have to read these pictures in more detail to begin to understand the architectural construct of these spaces. And it was the reading of these photographs um, connected to the accounts of research participants, which I'll expand upon um, in a little while, which allowed me to understand the shift from pre-war environments of galas and diving performances to post-war environments of recreation, sunbathing um, and pleasure. Um, it was a combination of the two which begin to reveal the kind of history of this space. But as aesthetic became secondary to function, we begin to see the different social and cultural relationships formed between building and its users and see that they symbolize values of community, cohesion, integration and equality, which inev inevitably allowed its youth to thrive in the heights of summer with friends and foes. But these pictures just go to show the value of these spaces to its youth during, its, during the, height of swim, the height of summer, really. Um, and I always thought it'd be really great to recreate the photo on the, on the, on the right with all those, um, all the swimmers that remain, albeit 60 years on. But what remained until the final days at Brunam was a local environment, a social space which connected people to it, to to the continuity of life, I suppose, um, a space which offered its use is the opportunity to reconnect with others, uh, a space which relied upon an active participant and defendants for six weeks of the summer holidays to survive. So that's kind of touching on the pool's history. And now we're going to look at the you know, um, final chapter, um, which will kind of look at and present my findings and how we, um, the researcher being myself and the research researched and um, being the participants which uh, helped the research manage to recover and reconstruct the spatial history um, of this pool which had very little um, documented history but the first thing I guess I need to answer is why do the research and what's its value. Why do I do it? I was kind of coincidence. It was my kind of um, last opportunity to explore soul interests for the very last time as an architecture student. Um, and I always had a desire to explore my hometown and its architecture. Um, but the pool seemed to be one of the last remaining fragments of buildings, kind of, which once gave life to my home community and many others across the region. These buildings are kind of reminders of the immense impact of the collective, uh, the collective that built the swimming pool at Maraman, the food that remained around South Wales, and the many others which have now returned to the landscape. But I guess we have to consider that we can't always go back and hold places still. Um, instead, we propose that 
we understand places by tracing the stories, both old and new, that make up places. Um, and it's the process was an effective way to discover forgotten and untold stories to fill in the gaps of seeming histories into consistency, if you like. And it was also about justifying a heritage asset and why it needed saving. But again, again, how do you justify the saving of a heritage asset when there is little documented history available? No architect, no blueprints, and no physical history. Um, it was a case of asking people what they remembered in the form of uh, recorded oral history accounts and how I could use uh, this material alongside other archival material to create a kind of mnemonic spatial reconstruction of architectural space. Um, all history as methods that, that I use allowed for a more kind of place-based understanding of, of buildings and all history is essentially an interview um, and it's more kind of a recording of someone's life history if you like um, and it, these stories captured the human stories behind the architectural one and my role was to extract the kind of programmatic spatial and material narratives of the pool to collectively reconstruct its social, spatial and cultural history. Um, and through diving into the space, the spatial history of former swimmers, caretakers and pool attendants, it kind of dredged up a wealth of information explaining the pool's social, cultural um, and spatial comp composition from voices of people who, um, until this paper was written, uh, remained unheard. Um, one of the voices um, was this gentleman. Uh, a fabricator with a welding workshop, um, which I was invited to record his oral history. His family had looked after the pool for many years and seemed like someone I really had to speak to. Um, so I called him up on a very rainy afternoon to see if he would be interested. And he said, um, come to the workshop by five this evening. And um, I wandered down with my laptop bag, um, images and um, yeah, knocked on that very big steel door, which you may see on. On, on the right hand side but as he instructed me to sit on this kind of ferrari red stainless steel bar stool we began to discuss and throughout which he would point to pictures to spatialize his experiences whilst i mapped out his words simultaneously he felt compelled to reconstruct his memory um, and draw his memories using a piece of chalk on this really big kind of well uh, steel plated table that 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 he had built as, as his kind of workbench. And it was at this point that I started to kind of understand that in this place where he was most comfortable, the, the narration of his childhood and connection to the people became more emotional, meaningful and powerful. But participants kind of spoke of a lot of um, very interesting things. Um, they spoke of the places where rugby players used to jump over the walls after training to cool down in the heights of summer. Uh, where others used to sneak in and jump um, and jump in and quote one of the participants um, suggested that they should jump, jump in fully naked. Um, there was other discussion about uh, the kind of architectural cascade which um, continued the flow of water and this was known by locals as the jacuzzi. Uh, there was stories of, of, of the, the terrace being the place where bathers used to get bitten by horse flies, the kiosk which sold hot teas, coffees, crisps and chocolate, um, and there was one account of uh, a wooden post where uh, one of the participants' grandfathers, who was also a pool, pool caretaker, would stand feet crossed, leaning against the post, smoking, whilst conducting his lifeguard duties. But it was these sort of accounts um, which kind of allowed me to question kind of the spatial composition of, of rule really and how rule was asserted. Um, and the lifeguard role is similarly to that of a prison watchtower attendant, where rule is applied through prowling the perimeter and maintaining order. However, at Pranamon, there was no uniform or, or kind of position to identify those in charge. They were arguably recognized because they were fully clothed. And the lack of differentiation, differ, differentiation suggests that um, their presence was purely cosmetic and as an act of surveillance um, with little acts of power on the ground. But we begin to answer questions of authority and the negotiation of hierarchy through connections to oral history accounts um, and connecting them with, with wider literature. 
And architecturally, accounts reveal insights into elements such as the terrace and its pebbled ash floor finish, which tarnished with the remnants of bare skin and grey feet, would kind of provide a really uncomfortable alternative to, subject to um, today's sun lounger. Um, but there were two distinct spaces which became of particular interest, the first being the terrace and the second being the spring balls. And it was the oral history accounts that became the link between existing literature, photographs and kind of lived world experience. Architecturally, the terrace, there was a kind of distinct friction between safety and comfort in the concrete tiles and the, and the, and, and, and the grades of aggregate used. While the use of coarse aggregates prioritise the safety of users in providing a non-slip surface, finer aggregates could have been offered more comfort, yet they would comprise on safety. So my observation is that there was a kind of a lack of architectural knowledge applied to the pool's construction, and it's emphasised in the small details, such as the one I just um, introduced about kind of aggregates, really. Um, but it's only through the oral history that I've been able to reveal specific elements of design which um, which caused discomfort. Um, and the springboards, springboards became the platform from which almost um, every local boy arguably derived his position in the social hierarchy. This vertical negotiation of hierarchy was contested perpendicular to the terrace and it can be suggested that attraction and popularity was earned from these boards. Um, and one participant recalled the top of the board became the right of passage, one where, um, where one would become a man and it can be argued that failing to perform accordingly resulted um, in the failure to gain social in this um, status, sorry, within this local world. Um, but additionally, questions were kind of posed um, relating to what went on and, and then there was one account which highlighted there was a bit of mingling going on with the girls and all that sort of stuff. Um, as you can kind of read on, on, on the screen, some of some of the ones um, who were more advanced than I was snuck off to do something slightly larger um, in the change rooms and doing things that they perhaps shouldn't have been doing. This was an, an, um, um, an account given by one of the interview subjects, but whether the participant was referring to themselves, to themselves or not is kind of another question. But additional questions um, can be posed in Kind of connecting accounts to this photograph uh, on the on the right, we can question why every every human in this photo is a boy and there's no girls within the photo. Um, and additionally, where the springboards were positioned, was it a case where this was the kind of start of a sexualizing photo? Maybe where was it the position where young men tried to perform in front of the girls sat sunbathing on the terrace? These are kind of questions which came about, but I didn't really have the capacity to explore really. But these previous slides were examples of how the direction of the research took and maybe it's where its value lies, really. Um, and its value lies, I think, in how a similar approach can be taken and applied to recover the spatial histories of other heritage buildings. Um, and this research alone won't save buildings, won't save the building. Rather, the method is what I believe can be applied universally to develop rich understanding of spatial and architectural elements of heritage buildings which can inform the next reinvention of such typologies and the next reinvention of the LIDO. Um, and old history and the remapping of uh, stories has offered me a kind of new way to understand the building's occupancy and use along with the multiple narratives of buildings, particularly those with no architect. Um, it allowed me to present an alternative way to understand buildings from the perspective of the everyday and outline that there are still ways to recover and co-construct spatial histories, even after its early occupants, builders and architects have passed away. And, and like the shards of, of, of um, like the shards of an art, art, archaeological dig, all history is a kind of artifact from which we could help reconstruct a period of the past, creating a mosaic narrative where the amalgamation of each individual spatial history reinforced by archival photographs exposes a way in which we can bring together um, stories into a spatial system where we represent the spoken word graphically. Um, and it can be seen as an intersubjective representation of the spoken word and the process offers a unique understanding of the space through different voices and provokes new questions relating to how we read buildings, uh, recover the heritage, the history of heritage buildings, and how we find new ways to repurpose architectural know-how and 
um, applied in ways which transcend but do not preclude the, the, the design of buildings. Um, and I guess I will leave you with this, um, an image which I kind of thought summed up what LIDO should, um, may represent. And like with many forms of commons, the aquatic common, um, their unrestrained problem, global capitalism. And I hope that we can build more connections between movements and cultures such as Britain's future LIDO groups and those at Graham who are working to counter forms of privatization. But the spaces where we swim together, sweat together and wash together are uh, embodied social spaces that connect us to the continuity of corporal life, um, aging, birth and death. And they offer us the chance to reconnect our bodies to, to each other really, and to be, and our bodies to, to the wider world and allow us to meet, mingle, socialize, uh, survive and swim through the modern challenges that life may present. Um, so yeah, hopefully I've given you an introduction to the Ladies of Wales and maybe you all know a bit more about them now. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. And um, yeah, I'm open to any questions that anybody has. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. That was brilliant. <laughs> There's uh, an awful lot to unpack in there. That was just uh, so much information about so many different bits. I've got lots of uh, sort of different notes about different aspects, um, but particularly with the, the case study of Bryn Amman, it's um, really fantastic to see how you've gone about that in terms of the, the combination of the, the sort of architectural and the heritage study, which I think with 20th century buildings, that the heritage side can get lost a little bit in terms of in relation to the architecture, so that sort of use of the, the psychogeography and mapping people's memories. Yeah. It's really fantastic tool to really bring, as you say, it's that day-to-day -day heritage, that intangible heritage and how that building, how that facility functioned within the lives of people yeah. that sort of brings that real heritage value to the fore, sort of alongside the sort of architectural um, yeah, I guess I guess that's the thing with heritage buildings is that I think like Lider, for example, it's original. You know, there's one gentleman I spoke to who was 90 years of age, and he told me of how he used to go down with his class when he was five years of age when the pool had just opened. And we're getting to a point now where people who used to use pools, um, you know, during the mid 20th century, are starting to lose their, you know, starting to lose them slowly, and and and, and it's a kind of now is the time, especially for this pool, where if we didn't start to recover its its history, then we'd lose its kind of you know its spatial history forever. Once all these um, users from the kind of 1950s, 60s, and 40s start to start to start sadly dying. Mm. Well, I think this is one of the points about 20th century heritage, in that. We are in a very unique opportunity to have people who, who can give us these first-hand accounts, um, which is why it's so important that it, these places are recognised as heritage now and this sort of work is done before we lose that opportunity. So, um, we've got a, a few questions from others coming in. So, um, so we've got Nathan who said, it's a great presentation, thank you. Uh, what are the future plans for, for Bryn Ammon? Um, as he remembers doing some consultation work on it a few years ago, but nothing seems to materialise since. I know there is a sort of ongoing campaign, but can you update us a bit on? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know very much about it, but I know this kind of small grants of funding which are coming in. Um, and I think there's um, discussion starting to form with um, with with local architects to develop a scheme um, which can really bring it back to the fore. So there's a small um, amount of uh, funding starting to come through, I think, for them to do feasibility studies and, and, and cost analysis and stuff. But I guess the, to get it really kind of reopened, there needs to be a large, um, a large grant of funding from the lottery or, or whatever it comes from to get this over the line. But I mean, it's getting to a point now where I think some sort of feasibility or kind of a grand vision um, may be coming in into um, into fruition, hopefully in the next couple of months. I mean, 
obviously I can't relate really with him because I don't don't know everything, but I know behind the scenes there's a lot of work going on um, from um, the committee, and yeah, hopefully one day um, we can yeah reopen it and transform transform the land, hopefully. So I'm right in, in 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 terms of surviving lie days and what there's, there's only one operational lie day still in use in Pontypridd. And... Yeah, so it's Pontypridd lie day, um, and I think Brunaman is the only remaining one which actually sits above ground. Okay, so um, that's the only the second one that could be brought back into use across. Yeah, Lydo. it's only the second one that could be brought back. Obviously, I know there's movements in with Abergavenny and, and so on where they're looking at. Um, Opening, reopening their pool. Obviously, I'm not quite sure uh, how they're approaching um, that project. But yeah, I think across the UK, there's a big, big kind of move to um, reopen Lido's and um, yeah, bring them back to life. Because I think the pandemic has shown us that we all crave kind of social interaction and being around each other. Sometimes I think these these environments are kind of great environments to to um, to bring people together and it's, and it's proven you know with, with um data from um swim england i think that they proved they've kind of suggested that pools say the nhs looks at something in the range of 350 million pound a year um and hopefully if we can get these kind of pools open it will take a little a small 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 um bit of strain off our national health service hopefully and sadly because a lot of these pools actually survived quite late into the, the, the 20th century, early 21st century. So it's actually been quite a short sort of uh, short time that we've, we've lost these and obviously the value of them has really been yeah, reclaimed again. Yeah, it was definitely, I think it, from my kind of research it was the leisure centre, which was the kind of, um, and the kind of lack of funding, the move inside, which kind of um, led us to kind of, move towards these more kind of spectacular slides and wave pools and everything. But I guess now a lot of people want to kind of return to a more simpler way of life, essentially. Well, I, I, I love the idea of the tornado, the sort of covers that you can take off in, in, in summer and sort of make them fully enclosed in winter. That seems like a yeah, it seems like very a, an ideal solution. I came across that pool after um, after writing the thesis. Actually, I was amazed by how they kind of hybridise from kind of semi permanent indoor structures, but then they can open their their kind of doors to become outdoor structures as well. Um, and I think there's examples in Australia of that. But obviously, the climate in in the, in the UK is something to to um, that would probably play a large part in some sort of hybrid structure being being proposed. So we've got a, another question um, from Bethan, which said, was there a conscious effort by the builders of the Lidos in the Welsh industrial towns to try and block out the towns around them and sort of create a, a sense of escapism by sort of being perhaps within this quite sleek, modernist sort of environment? Well, I guess I'm not quite sure. I mean, when I was looking at the kind of pools of kind of um, to Herbert and places which had kind of expressed brickwork and they looked like they were they had much more of a kind of considered construction um, and they were a little bit more complex, but they followed, you know, if you look at the roof lines in the background, there's just some like, pitch roof and the use of slate and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I didn't really come across much which revealed that you know, there was a distinct lack of funding for rural pools and so on. I think because um, a lot more people lived in towns like Trehubert and stuff, there was a lot more kind of um, urban district funding which would go towards the construction of not just a pool but the wider recreational site of kind of the tennis courts um, and stuff like that but in cases like Bernama it was fully built by um, the voluntary labour of kind of um, local fathers and grandfathers who um, during times of kind of extreme hardship and the economic depression of the 1930s um, wanted to really give their youth that one sense of hope, really. And, and I think, like I mentioned, that the kind of white, sleek, modern disappearance served to be a contrast to everything that was black and coal, coal dust covered around it, which I, which I found really interesting. Really. And if, if you look at those pools sort of in the, the, the South Wales valleys, which are sort of built and funded through those 
uh, processes and then obviously those of the, the sort of resorts of the, the North Wales Riviera, Llandudno yeah. uh, and Prill and Prista. Is, is there sort of an architectural distinction that you can sort of see there or? Um, I, I say the pools of, of North Wales and coastal like uh, in Bay, they were a lot more um, architectural but I think they were symbolic of something other. I think the pools of the South Wales valleys, they were not about kind of containing this human seal kind of um, reappraisal of the human body. They were about giving kind of hardworking men who had been hacking the cold face all day that bit of respite at the end of the day where they could take their children or their children could go and play after school just to give a little bit of respite from the kind of um, the working days that they had. But I think in North Wales and um, some of the coastal kind of pools around the UK, they had a lot of kind of expressed architecture in terms of kind of fountains and, and, and statues and cascades and so sort of that. And I think they were symbolic of the kind of um, the leisure, the pleasure, the kind of, it was in them pools, it was all about expressing the human body and, you know, having that bronze skin skin look. And I think in the, in, in the pools of the South Wales coalfield, the very much kind of simplistic, um structures really yeah right so we've had uh, um a lot of comments saying really great presentation um some chris romilly his fascinating talk we should meet for a coffee uh where can i read your thesis <laughs> um my Is thesis it online? um it hasn't been released because i mean i spoke with julie from uh, the committee at pranaman about this i i printed some copies off and i I think it, it wasn't about me, it was more about the pool and it was more to give something to, to the committee so they could use the piece of physical evidence to go to the Architectural Heritage Fund and say, you know, we have this bit of written history on it. Could, you know, could you be convinced by this, if you like, to, as a case to give us some funding? I don't know whether that, that, that's how it worked or not. Um, I haven't released it. Um, it is sat on my hard drive in a minute doing nothing um it is in a kind of book format i have a couple of copies um but yeah maybe like a, a work in progress to bring it's, it it's, out it's, to the sort of public because i'm not quite sure what to do next with it you know what i mean like obviously i've got to this point where i can present to you but whether it becomes a um the kind of beginnings of a wider research project in, in, in future years it may be, you know, I'm at, I'm at the start of my architecture career working in practice, maybe in a few years time, practice won't be for me and I'll just disappear back to the academic environment again and um, see where it takes me. But yeah, um, I suppose I haven't answered your question, but it's not available to read at the minute, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, but I, guess I, I think that the, the, the scope for further research and the interest is... Um... Yeah, it's just like if I release it now, am I giving... I might just like giving it all away so I can't build it in the future. But yes, Chris has mentioned um, we should meet for a coffee. So um, yeah, maybe I'll uh, I'll bring a copy that you can um, you can borrow and read um, in the meantime. Uh, we've got a comment from Tamsin. Uh, a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Lots of resonance for me with working class built heritage that has been and is being lost in Cardiff. Obviously, Empire Pool. Yeah. The, um, Beautiful example. Uh, the use that working class people make of buildings and spaces is not as valued as it should be, and your research is a valuable way of making these uses explicit. So, as I say, it's yeah, I mean, that, that I guess, heritage value. Is, I guess that point is obviously I managed to do a case in Brunham because I was a student and it was free, and you know, no one can expect any professional architect, designer, or any kind of um, expert in kind of architectural know-how to to do these things go into heritage buildings and uncover their history um for nothing so it's kind of i've done it for this case but it's kind of how do you how do you turn it into a product that people can purchase as a service if you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and i guess with heritage buildings this is one of the methods which i found um 
and it worked in recovering its spatial history to an extent. And I could have written 30,000 words on this alone, but I was restricted to 10. Um, and yeah, I guess making a tangible product out of it is something that um, needs to be looked on in, in further things. So we can use the method and use the service of um, people who have, um, like architects who have a kind of unique understanding of space and can read space uniquely and how they can, you know, take on heritage assets um, and maybe propose this service as a, as a part of the kind of wider fee really. Um, and then everyone can get a bigger understanding or greater understanding of where their asset or where their pool has come from. Um, and we've got a, a comment from, uh, thank you, Josh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, could you just say what are or were the six or so Lidos in North Wales? Can I add to that and say, which were the two in Mid Wales? Uh, I will just go back to the map. I think of any, I'm guessing, was the southern. So there's Sandra in North Wales, there's Bill Wells in Mid Wales. Okay. North Wales, Prestatin, Rill. This one, I think, is Port Madog. Um, Carnarvon is another one, and there's two which I can't remember. If you give me a second, I'll actually. Definitely you know, guessing that would be Sandard No, Colwyn Bay. Colwyn Bay is really interesting. Yeah, uh, they I think were the six. Um, I mean, I couldn't tell you all the ones in the South Wales coalfield, but... It's quite interesting that the two sort of outliers in um, Built Wells and Sandrin Dodd Wells then. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you see in Wales today, there's that kind of... They're almost like two different countries. There's North Wales and there's South Wales with uh, Little Aberystwyth uh, <laughs> in the middle. Uh, right, and then we've got from Mailer. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. really enjoyed. A couple of questions, if I may. Do you think the Lido in the UK can be seen as a symbol of the 1930s in both its architecture and its social political context? And two, do you think there will be another golden age for the Lido? It's Pontypri the good blueprint for the future. I mean, I'll answer the second one first. Um, controversially, I don't think Pontypri is a good blueprint for future pools because you see now with energy crises and stuff that I, I I don't think myself that pools as just swimming pool can be a sustainable typology. Um, I don't think it can be sustained for however long these you know, new invention, new typologies last before they they need to be reinvented again. Um, and I think you know you see many buildings anywhere you go in. in, in in cities, there's a lot of, kind of mixed use buildings, but I guess if I was to suggest Brahman as an example, uh, this is just my personal opinion, is that I don't think the pool would be, I, I think architecture in this day is not just about kind of social environmental impact, a lot of it is about economics. Um, and that's one of the most important things. If you can't get a building to make money, then how, how can you imagine it to sustain itself? So I think it's just diversifying your offering. It can be a swimming pool, but what else can it be? Like there was discussion in the 1930s of the Pool of Brunhamen being a space for, you know, public lectures and stuff. And, you know, there's, there's examples. I mean, I haven't touched on these because I haven't um, taken you on to them, but there's examples, you know, this is really the extreme example of, you know, this is in Finland. Um, and this is a kind of high realized pool that comes in the form of a ski slope. There's a kind of um, boot camp pools. There's you know, in Charlton Lido, which is kind of a simple, um, has kind of a simple addition to it. Um, and then there's these ones, which you find on kind of rivers, which are kind of um, really for the kind of um, yuppies of urban centers, if you like. But to answer that first question, I think there is a golden age coming up for them. Um, Hopefully there is, but I don't think Pontypridd is a good blueprint for the future. To answer your first question, uh, do you think I'm going to see? I mean, I guess they can be because I think the way they're restored in this day and age is a kind of um, 
sensitive touch. I don't think many people try to knock them all down and rebuild them. They try to kind of sensitively restore um, the existing buildings. So in its architecture, I think they can be seen as symbols of the 1930s. Um, in its social and political context, I guess that's a different um, diff enormous one. question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, socially, yes, I think you know, back in them days, it was where, where youth and where people would go for a bit of respite. And I think you go to, you know, pools by me and Tooting and places like that. I think that's what, where people go, you know, you, you have the kind of performance orientated swimmers who go in there kind of very fast, fast and medium lanes. And then come the summer months, you have these um, uh, pleasure seeking swimmers who go there to sunbathe and, and relax. And that's what they were there for, I think, um, early on, although initially, they had kind of militaristic attitudes. Post kind of Second World War, they started to change into places of kind of um, yeah, places for people to kind of in, interact and kind of just relax together. I think, um, and I guess today it's finding a balance of the two because a lot of people there's a big kind of triathlete movement of you know performance orientated swimmers, and then you know there's. I did initial research on London Fields, which unfortunately wasn't used, but um, at that field, participants spoke of kind of conflict between performance orientated swimmers and um, social, social swimmers who just wanted to kind of swim and socialize and talk. Um, so yeah, there's, there's conflict between multiple kind of negotiators. Um, so yeah, I don't know whether that answered your question. I just started rambling. <laughs> I suppose as, as opposed to a lot of sporting sort of venues, it's a lot more egalitarian in that sense and that you yeah, can have that a, mixture of... There's a balance to be struck, the, I think. The, which, the sporting and then those who are there just to view or just to for leisure swimmers. Or, yeah, yeah, sure. I suppose you know, in terms of that interwar period, I suppose a bit like the cinema, is that other sort of interwar architectural icon of that sort of... Uh, yeah, but I think definitely leveling up of, of the sort of affordability of of leisure for everybody who, without that sort of segregation, in in yeah. Life. yeah, they're very interesting, interesting buildings. I think they're not buildings which you can kind of totally reinvent and you know, redevelop everything outside into these totally different architectures. I think they have to be kind of sensitively restored to, um, yeah, to, to, to kind of reinvent. But also remember what what they actually stood symbolised in the early days. Right, I'm just going to have one last quick question because I realise that time is uh, is yeah. getting on. Um, so we've just had Trian on, who's asked. Uh, she's wondering what effect the closure of the Lido had on the Brunaman area socially and culturally, and what other recreational amenities that they had. Was that the only recreational amenity that served the area, or were there others? Um, as a sports field right next, I mean, asset-wise, it has a number of sports uh, sport fields and kind of tennis courts and stuff like that. Um, but I think Brunaman was, it was at the hands of kind of industrial decline. And when the coal mining went, there was no kind of work for, for people. People had to start commuting for work. And, you know, it went from a, a booming centre of industry with a, a very, you know, um, very strong high street to um, unfortunately a place which has suffered massively from industrial decline. But one thing I've, I've observed from you know going back home and spending a bit of time there is that the amount of people from England who are you know moving moving to Brunham. Um and I guess maybe its location has um, something to play in it. It sits on the edge of the black of the Black Mountains. Um, you know you have the countryside on your doorstep. You know, for cyclists and stuff like that, or you know, people who want just a, a calmer way of life, it's there. But I guess for me, it needs this catalyst, which can kind of bring it back to what it used. To, maybe not bring it back to what it used to be. You know, in this industrial period, but give it the kind of um, what's the word? I guess give it the kind of respect that it needed from 
or it deserves from what it actually provides for the wider context of the South Wales coalfield. Um, and at the minute, it's, I wouldn't say it's on its knees, but there's, there's really small, um, small projects which I think are building Burnham and back up and they're kind of interweaving together. And, and this, you know, this LIDAR project will hopefully be a massive catalyst for change and it, it'll hopefully, you know, bring, um, bring employment out and hopefully give, give um, Burnham a, not a new start, but a new kind of um, new recreational facility for its kid, for, for, for its use to, I guess, give them a, a really good platform to, to, to build on really. Because at the minute they haven't got, they haven't got much to, 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 to play with like many rural communities. There isn't much recreation of facilities for children to use. They have to go to local towns to seek it. And that's probably why, you know, news fall into, vandalism and um, a lot of it's out of boredom really um mm. but yeah hopefully this pool will and many others hopefully will be able to give kind of the platform for um yeah the, the younger population to, to have a better start or improved start should we say fantastic thanks for, well, i think we've got through all the questions <laughs> um so thank you for for giving us so much time and uh, thank you for the, for the talk this evening it was fantastic thank you. Um, so that's it from us for this evening um, so thanks for the wonderful talk thank you everybody for attending and um, I hope that we'll see you at some of our future events like Harlech in October or our next online talk in November so Joel Hippab Ahul